In this video, I'm going to demonstrate a physical exam in a cat. This is Tigger, and like a lot of cats that come into the veterinary clinic, they come in a carrier. And so, to start my examination, um, I'll either open the door and get Tigger out, or I'll lift the top off of the carrier. It can be a little less stressful. And if I'm in an enclosed area, I'll start by doing what's called my hands-off examination. I'll let the cat roam around the room, and I'll watch him walk, I'll watch him posture. Um, what I'm looking for are things like limping, um, scuffing of the feet, balance, coordination, um, head tilt, things like that. Um, you can also get an idea for their ability uh, to see, to traverse through obstacles in the room, their ability to smell, if they're smelling uh, in the room, and their overall demeanor. So if you're able to do that in the room, that's, um, that gives you a, a lot of good information. Once you're done with your hands-off examination, we'll start with the hands-on examination. And I like to start by making friends with the cat. And what we're going to do is actually lift Tigger out of the carrier. We can keep Tigger's favorite towel. So uh, Tigger is a, a very friendly cat, but if we had a cat that um, objected to us touching him, doing an exam, then we may want to place uh, a muzzle on the cat. And so there's a several different types. This type just goes around like that, and if you come from behind and sort of surprise them a little bit, they won't see it coming. coming. Now this doesn't do anything for their claws, um, so you'll need to have some restraint um, to help control those. Uh, but not only does this help prevent, doesn't completely prevent, but help prevent biting, um, it, it somewhat keeps them occupied so that they're thinking about something else other than what you're trying to do to them. So once I've made friends uh, with our patient here, what I like to do is just inspect the face and I'm looking for symmetry and I'll also use my fingers to palpate the face. And I'll run my hands along uh, each side of the skull, along the zygomatic arch, around the orbital rim, along the jaw, back towards the TMJ. And I'm noting any asymmetry, bulges, masses, areas of pain as well. I'll look in the eye, in each eye, and I'm looking at the conjunctiva, I'm looking at the sclera, the iris, and the cornea. I'm noting if there's any increased redness, any discoloration such as jaundice, I'll do a pupillary light reflex. So I want to see the pupil constrict. I'll also note any epiphora or tear staining or any blepharospasm or squinting in either eye. You can also palpate the eyes by simply placing your thumb and finger, close the eyelids, and uh, get an idea for symmetry. I'll look at the nares, I'll note any discharge. You can also assess airflow through the nares uh, if you suspect there might be an intranasal obstruction uh, by either using a microscope slide to see if it fogs or you can take wisps of cotton from a cotton tipped applicator to see if that moves. Then we'll look inside the mouth. And before I try to pry his mouth open, I'm just going to lift up his cheeks and lips. I'm looking at the teeth. I'm noting any calculi, tartar, gingivitis, missing teeth, cracked teeth, uh, oral ulcers. And 
And once I've sort of looked in, then I'll open the mouth. Usually you get a couple of seconds to look inside the mouth, so I need to make that time count. So we'll look, have them look towards the light in the ceiling so you can get a good view and look underneath the tongue. We'll take a second look here. I'm noting any masses, tongue movement, things like that. I'm also noting if there's any pain when I do this. I'm coming underneath the jaw here, running my fingers along uh, the jaw. Next I'll come to the ears and I'll look at the, the pinna of each ear. I'm noting any discoloration. And then I'll look at the opening of the external ear canal, note any discharge and then I'll palpate the external ear canal by just using my thumb and finger and you can palpate that external ear canal. It should be firm but it should be uh, somewhat compressible and it should not be painful. Next I'll do an otoscopic examination and cats are variable on how well they'll tolerate this and sometimes you need some help So what I'll do is um, I have a small cone on here. I'm going to grasp the pinna and I'm going to place the cone down in the external ear canal and I'll take a look. And then I have to make a slight bend to look all the way into that horizontal ear canal and look at the tympanum. Now Tigger's a fairly tolerant cat. Not every cat's going to be this, this docile and allow you to do this. I'm going to make my way down to the larynx and the trachea. Again, I'm feeling for any lumps and bumps that shouldn't be there. I'm also palpating the thyroid glands. Normally the thyroid glands aren't readily palpable unless they're enlarged. And so if I feel the thyroid glands and they slip between my fingers, uh, and you can usually uh, appreciate that they're enlarged. I'll take note if my palpation also elicits any kind of cough. I'll work my way down. I'll feel the mandibular sal uh, excuse me, mandibular lymph nodes. They're not always palpable in every cat, but if you are able to palpate them, you might find that they're enlarged, but not always. I'll move down to the prescapular lymph nodes. So the prescapular lymph nodes are just cranial to the acromion process of the scapula. They're not always palpable as well, but if they're enlarged, then they may be palpable. I'm going to feel the forelimb, and I'm feeling for anything uh, such as muscle atrophy, lumps, bumps, painful areas, and it's nice to do this on both sides, both limbs simultaneously, because it helps appreciate any asymmetry that might be going on. work my way down. We'll take a look at the pads, digits, nails. Now I'm working my way down to the thoracic trunk and again I'm feeling for any subcutaneous masses. And at this point I'm going to do my cardiac auscultation and pulmonary auscultation. So I'm going to start on the left hand side of the chest and I'll start with cardiac auscultation and um, I'm going to try to listen for my mitral valve and the aortic and pulmonic valves on the left side.
if you find that your patient is purring a little too loud for you to hear, sometimes just picking them up like this will stop the purring. The mitral valve should be around the fifth intercostal space and the aortic and pulmonary should be around spaces three and four on the left side. As I auscultate, I'm also gonna feel for ephemeral pulse. I'm gonna note the pulse strength and also note any pulse deficits. That is, if there is an audible heartbeat uh, but no palpable pulse associated with that heartbeat. So I have my left hand on the femoral artery. At this point, you can get a heart rate. Now on the right side, I'm going to listen for the tricuspid valve. It's in intercostal space three or four. And then I'm going to listen to the lung fields. And I'll slide the diaphragm portion of my stethoscope dorsal and ventral, and move back a little bit caudal. To listen for lung sounds. This is a good time to get a respiratory rate. If you hear abnormal sounds, you're not sure if they're actually coming from uh, the lower airways, you can auscultate the upper airways uh, to compare to see if maybe it's being referred from the upper airways. Next, I'll slide my hands down to the abdominal trunk, feeling the subcutaneous area. And I'm also going to do my abdominal palpation, where I'm feeling the organs in the abdominal cavity. And I think the easiest way to do this is to uh, stand behind uh, the patient and bring my fingers together like this and allow the organs to slip between uh, the fingers and each hand. You can do it while they're laying here you can do it while they're standing. Sometimes cats aren't real good at standing. So in the cranial abdominal cavity, I'm gonna to try to see if I can palpate the caudal extent of the liver. In cats, you can usually palpate each kidney in the dorsal mid-abdomen. You can palpate loops of bowel, not individually, but as a group. And you can palpate the urinary bladder. Next, I'm going to look at the hind limbs, run my hands over, look at the digits, nails. If I saw any lameness or any neurological issues, uh, on my hands-off exam, then I may want to do a full orthopedic exam on the patient. Look at the other leg. I want to look at the tail, the base of the tail. And I want to look under the tail. And look at the penis. And now is a good time to take a temperature. 
usually that uh, they object, object to that the most, and so that's a good thing to do last. And once you're done with that, then um, you can also repeat your hands-off examination, check their demeanor, see if there's any lameness, incoordination, or anything like that. And certainly, if during your exam you pick up on a neurological problem, abnormalities, uh, you, you will do a full neurological examination. If you notice any ocular uh, problems, you're going to do a full uh, ophthalmologic examination. You'll also want to look at the skin. So you want to part uh, the hair and look down towards the skin. Notice if there's any alopecia. And you want to do this not just on the dorsum, but also on the ventrum. Note for any parasites. This is also a good time to palpate for any mammary tumors. And then you'll also want to assign a body condition score. So charts are available to help you determine the body condition score, but it does require you to palpate the spine of the cat, the abdomen, um, and also look at the cat from the top, from the profile, to assign a body condition score. Some owners get a little bit uneasy with a physical exam. Uh, they may think that you're going to create some discomfort and it's, um, if that's the case, you may want to uh, talk them through them and explain what you're doing as you're doing it. That's also um, can be very helpful to owners. And that concludes the feline physical examination.